from the 2023 NFL Combine, this is Patriots Unfiltered. All right, guys, it's Deuce and Lazar back at the Combine. P with the Combine. That's Episode a nice number ring two. to it. Deuce, Deuce and Lazar. Lazar. I, like I like it. That. Who knows? Maybe we'll, we'll, we'll get the our own Deuce podcast one Lazar. day. The Deuce and Lazar. <laughs> We're back, guys. We're here at the Scouting Combine. We just wrapped up a day with uh, the defensive backs and the special teams. So this is going to be our uh, long-form podcast to kind of hash out, um, you know, just a little bit more detail. We shot a video already. You guys can, you want to get the quick hits, you go to that. Um, but this is going to be a little bit more of a, a longer-form discussion. And be sure to stay tuned uh, at the end. We we had an interview with Mike Rodak, who uh, had time with the Patriots in the early 2010s and now uh, has been down at Alabama. So some great insight from Mike uh, about Bill O'Brien, about Mac Jones, about how you know the offense might come together with those two guys, as well as a lot of the Alabama prospects, um, some of whom we got to see today. So uh, we can tease some of that up. We but... may or may not have covered all 13 prospects with Mike Rodak that are here from <laughs> Alabama. I was peppering them. So. We walked. It was it was great, and I mean Mike knows knows his stuff, and certainly it's it's cool to talk to somebody from the college ranks who just knows it. In inside and out right. um, so he when you were bringing up certain plays and stuff he knew exactly what you were talking about um, but off the top let's uh, you know let's talk about special teams that was the first thing we saw and of course Jake Moody kicker from Michigan uh, was MVP of the Shrine Bowl game um, got to hear from him today and yeah, it's a lot of people you look at the mock drafts anybody with a mock draft they probably have Jake Moody maybe in that last pick I don't know if he's gonna last that long but as far as today he seems like he's gonna be an NFL kicker some of the buzz that we're hearing here in Indy about Jake Moody is that the Patriots might need to pounce earlier than maybe some people would want them to pounce. I think we're all on board with Jake Moody as the Patriots kicker of the future. Not No disrespect to Nick Folk, who's been money for them, but he's getting up there in age. He's going to be 38, 39 years old uh, next season. I think it's time to start to look for the next generation at that position, just like any other position. Jake Moody, though, I, I think the fifth round is his floor. I don't think he's getting out of the fifth round. And that's going to be an interesting approach for the Patriots. They have three projected fourth-round picks. They potentially could have four sixth-round picks. So they have a bunch of picks, but they don't actually have a pick in the fifth round. So they could potentially move up, I suppose, with the sixth or move back with a fourth or try to find that sweet spot for Jake Moody. But I think he's going to be a fourth or fifth-round guy. So we talked to Michael Turk as well. We were kind of, we you know, we just got a shout out to us real quick because a lot of people, they didn't show up this morning at 8.30 for the special no, teamers. No, they did not. I didn't see a lot of the, the Boston beat was, wasn't here for that <laughs> one. They were until the 9.30 when the DBs came out. Uh, but Evan and I were here uh, along with the hardcore people. So um, Michael Turk, punter from Oklahoma, talked to him a little bit, another Shrine Bowl guy, uh, as well as Adam Korsik from, hey, he went to Rutgers. So you, Ozzie, you know, Ozzie, you Ozzie. Know. But I didn't even realize, all of a sudden you walk up and you hear the Australian yeah. accent and you realize, hey, this guy's a little bit different. Uh, a lot of cool stuff kind of coming out of that that left us uh, you know chatting a little bit about Australian style punting and, and all the different things that he uh, he can do so Turk is garnering some late buzz here in terms of rising up the board yes rising up the board for a punter I know <laughs> from the Shrine Bowl had a great week out there looks a lot uh, like a guy that potentially could get drafted but Corsic from Rutgers is the consensus top punter in this draft this draft at punter is not like the draft that we had last year uh, you know where we had guys like Jordan Stout right this is not as good of that of draft there but they do have some good draft uh, punter eligible guys that will be later in the draft this is where maybe the Patriots could send a seventh round pick out there and just get him before he hits priority free agency where they don't have to compete with him as a Uf UDFA with a bunch of other teams. I thought what was really interesting about Corsic is that he feels like he can use all the different clubs in his bag to almost change up on the returners, right? One time it's an Aussie punt. One time it's a traditional punt. One time it's a boomer. One time it's like a coffin corner, right? And you could sort of do all these different tricks of the trade that might be appealing like that that might be a little bit different so we'll see all right guys don't worry now we're uh, we're off the special teams talk so for those <laughs> I, I, of you we who, only went what two minutes on special teams about two minutes so. will go an hour so don't worry about it <laughs> so if you want even more explanation of that go to catch 22 which will be uh, going live here today at two o'clock so you can catch that uh, on, on demand as well by the point that, that this gets posted so let's move on to the defensive backs and and the guys that i were i was most excited to see was just brian branch because 
look, he has a great film. I mean, he's just a tackling machine. He anticipates, he sees it, he goes, and he takes guys down. And it's just a lot of fun to watch. And I think for good reason, a lot of people, you know, even though it's not a huge need, sometimes connects into the Patriots. Mike Rodak had plenty to say about Branch. He seems like he's going to go in that kind of mid-first round range. Not a big need, but certainly seems like a guy who's a Patriots fit. Yeah, we had a great conversation with Mike about Branch. So I won't go too long on him here. But I think the main thing that you see with him is that he's working out with the corners this week instead of the safeties. And then I asked him what went into that decision, and he just said that the combine came to him, said, where do you want, who do you want to work out with? Because he is more of a slot star type of corner in that slot defender role, and he said corners. Now, to me, if the Patriots draft him, I think that he's a perfect candidate to move to the back end just like Devin McCourty did coming out of college out of Rutgers. He has the cover skills to maybe do that a little bit, but I think the click and close, the instincts, the range at free safety would fit in extremely well for the Patriots in the back end of this defense. So I could see that being the case where they draft him. Maybe he plays early on in that sort of star or slot defender role just because that's what he's most comfortable with, but eventually he transitions to free safety. Now, now two other guys that I that I underlined, two guys that I was I was interested to see, Jair Brown and Sidney Brown, the two Browns. Um, just two guys that listening to them talk and based on their versatility and the type of players they are, again, strong safety types. I don't, you know, I don't know if that's exactly a need. How much free safety can they play? Um, but those two guys, to me, just listening to them, I'm like, I could see these guys in that locker room in New England. Jair Brown's an interesting player because he plays on fire. He's somebody that flies around the field, excellent motor, that, that type of player that I think that they love those types of guys that just love ball love ball and want to be out there and want to play i could see that but i we talked about this in the short uh form i asked him what do you want to do out there like if the play call comes in the huddle and he says he wants to blitz and i was like <laughs> no no wrong answer no just kidding uh but no in all seriousness this is a downhill player yeah. right and, and that's where i think that maybe there's not a much as much of a fit uh, for the patriots with their needs currently i think antonio johnson who might be the second safety off the board behind brian yeah. branch and, and i don't know if you want to call branch a safety or corner but whatever uh, he's one of those guys too that nfl.com compares to kyle duggar so do you want two kyle duggars or do you want something a little bit different i think a lot of the guys like that in this draft are you know like jair brown for example are in that mold which is a little bit worrisome I would say I mean Jerry Brown it seemed like Kyle Duggar like just his deep voice just the way he like the intensity in his eyes I'm like this is Kyle Duggar uh but again it's like you fall in love with these strong safety types you're like how many how many do we really need there are other needs of course I uh, just I wanted to bring up Trey Dean too a uh, guy that you know you, you yes. had in your first mock guy who played at the Shrine Bowl again heard him today talking a little bit about how cool it was you know to play there and get some coaching um from the Patriots so you know there are some later kind of round options Chris Smith was another one you brought up from Georgia um, they just it's it's hard because you like these guys they play tough they're wow you could bring an element to the team but you just see other needs probably bigger yeah Chris Smith is probably the one true free safety that I think is going to get drafted in the top 100 potentially and he's someone that's a little bit smaller than the rest of this group doesn't have that type of uh, you know physicality or uh, be able to play in the box type of skill set but may, that's what they need and I think the one thing I've always looked at with the Georgia defense is that is an NFL defense, right? In terms of scheme and play calls and design. Kirby Smart's out there. He's running a match. He's running Ripley's. He's running eyes. He's running zeros. Like he's running the whole book. So that's, I think, something that I've always thought was interesting that they haven't necessarily dipped into that Georgia pipeline yet because Kirby obviously comes from Saban who comes from Bill so I, it, there is a big connection there yeah. so I, I wonder at what point in time do we finally see a, a Georgia defender make their way to New England so Quay Walker and a Kobe Dean like mm -hmm. uh, Devontae Hawaii last year like there's so many names that we just kept on throwing out there and it just seems to not ever happen the funny thing for me last year real quick was when I first watched Trayvon Walker and we all know my draft process yeah. I know nothing till I watch and at that time I think early in the draft process, he was, you know, a mid first round, maybe second round guy. It was, and I watched him and I was like, oh my God. I'm like, can we, th like, this is what I want. Right. And of course, he goes first overall. Yeah. And, you know, hey, I guess I know, I know what I'm talking about. What do you know, Mike? <laughs> I guess. So let's move on now because the cornerbacks, and that's really the, the what, what we took from today. Um, it's just a dynamite class. And, you know, I think first, I just want to preface this with a little bit of a, since we're on our long form pod, 
You've heard Evan probably mention Rip Liz, which is you know kind of the new thing that was developed by Bill Belichick, Nick Saban. It's you know match coverage, and and and, and I've been really trying this off season to to dive into it a little bit, just to get a little bit of what why teams are going this. And I almost equate it to you know Josh McDaniels, and then that offense was a little bit famous for you know having route adjustments. So you know what is the defense going to do? We're going to adjust to them. Um, this is almost a counter to that, where the defense said, look. It's going to become man at some point. It starts out a zone, but once you declare your routes, we're going to disperse and we're going to cover whatever you can. So my point being, I know we've been talking a lot this offseason and just generally about how the Patriots love man coverage. They play a lot of man coverage. I don't know what those numbers mean exactly because another conversation we had, how much is it as pure man? How much are these people who are watching the game tape looking at it and saying, that looks like man to me. Well, yeah, you know, three seconds into the snap, yeah, it is man. It becomes man, but, it, you know, it's it's actually match coverage. Um, so my question really to, to kind of start off this cornerback thing is, what are we looking for at cornerback? Are right. we still looking for a true press man coverage, or are we looking for a smart tackling guy who's going to understand how the routes disperse and where he has to go and process that quick? You've mentioned a couple times here in all the content we've been spitting out right now of guys from these uh, that we've been listening to saying they have experience in rip liz and and match coverage so um just to kind of set it up i think that's that's kind of where i'm at philosophically which one of these guys do we get on what what traits are we looking for are we still looking for that press man coverage or is this something different now well first of all we're gonna have to get a whiteboard out and do some rip liz <laughs> at some point in time I, I, because this is it's awesome and really where it comes from not to go too deep because this is uh, i actually asked belichick about this a couple years ago and he said well i, I mean we could write a book about this <laughs> Sure. But uh, he so he, he gave a short form answer of it, though. And basically uh, what happened was is when the uh, Browns would play the Steelers in the 90s, uh, the, Steel the Browns were predominantly a cover three defense. Believe it or not, Bill Belichick under Bill Parcells was a cover three zone mm -hmm. defensive coach. He mm -hmm. wasn't a man coach yet. Yeah. And they got to Cleveland and Pittsburgh would run four verts and just flood the deep part of the field yep. against cover three. And they had no answer for it. They would just really struggle in that. So Saban and Belichick got together. Saban had a little bit more man coverage experience than Coach Belichick. And they got their two minds together and they created Rip Liz, which is a match cover three zone. Mm -hmm. So... Saban has Rip Liz. He has cover seven, which is a split safety version of Rip Liz as well. And you can bracket receivers, and we won't get all into that right now. But basically, <laughs> as the, much as we want to, the point that you're making is that you see a lot of that now in New England, and you see that I would say a lot of that around the NFL. I think a team that's really adopted a lot of those types of rules as well as the Cincinnati Bengals, and they don't necessarily have a dominant corner in mm -hmm. their secondary, but uh, you know, uh, Lou Amanorimo is great at disguising and doing a lot of the same things the Patriots do. So the couple guys, though, to kind of continue on this point that I think really fit that I don't know if he's going to be on the board at 14, but Christian Gonzalez from Oregon is a perfect matchup with that. Like, he can play press man, and he can play match zone. There's so many times on film where, you know, the receiver that he's lined up over runs a, a shorter route and under, and he gets depth, right? And he gets up the field and ends up taking the vertical in a match zone. There's so many times where you get some people's faces and plays press man. I think he's the easiest transition into something like that besides maybe uh, the actual Alabama and Georgia corners that are in this draft, like Achille Ringo or an Eli Ricks. But in terms of what uh, Christian Gonzalez can do i'm really impressed with his instincts his awareness and coverage and his smarts and his intelligence to be able to play those multiple coverages so uh, he's someone at the top of this draft that if the patriots come away with him at 14 you have to be thrilled and let's stay at the top because i think we were both really impressed by joey porter jr and you know as patriots fans maybe growing up we're expecting to see angry dog joey porter you know rah, 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 you know and he he Nothing has like definitely that. a different personality uh was asked you know about hey if he went to the ravens hey if he went to the patriots has all the right uh, I'll let you respond to what he said about the Patriots, which was great. Um, but, you know, I think that was kind of my question coming in is like, you know, is is he this kind of guy? But he didn't seem like that at all. He seemed like he's got, you know, just a really level headed kind of player, physical Penn State guy. I don't know if that matters, but right. another guy who fits very poised up there, very poised, very in control and. I would say that you look at guys like this and more and more, even despite their father's play temperament or their father's attitude, which we know Joey Porter has always been a very outspoken, competitive, rah-rah type of guy. It doesn't seem like that trickles down to the, the See more the Stephon son. Gilmore than, right. than you know, yeah. and he's cornerback. He's very, very chill, very, uh, you know, 
confident in himself and he was asked about the Patriots and his father obviously a rivalry a competitiveness there and he mentioned that he thinks his father would actually be happy about getting drafted by the Patriots because he knows that Bill Belichick is there and it's going to be uh, putting Joey and in, in Joey Jr. <laughs> in the best position to succeed so I thought that was an interesting answer uh, he's another one of those guys that's a uh, 6'3 I, I would say maybe 6'2 uh, extremely long his wingspan is going to maybe be record-breaking for mm. a cornerback prospect he's got a huge wingspan he can play press man he can play three uh, because of his length and I the guy that you hear the ceiling comp you hear a lot of sauce Gardner now sauce Gardner was an all-pro corner mm. right out of the gate yeah. as a rookie very rare so I, I wouldn't necessarily put that on Joey Porter Jr., but he definitely has that type of potential. So just a few other guys I, you know, that I've been kind of looking at that, that I like. I mean, Clark Phillips, Emmanuel Forbes, who's just got crazy ball production. Uh, Riley Moss, I've been on the fence about like listening to him, though, today. He said He's all the right an things. He's an interesting like, mid-round guy, yeah. third or fourth round, if they miss out on some of this top wave. Devin Witherspoon, though, is uh, an interesting one because he's another one of those top probably three corners, um, super physical. I mean, geez, he's just lighting guys up left and right in the backfield, um, but did not speak today. They were like, he's getting an MRI, which I was kind of surprised that they would just like put that out there as if like they found something serious. Um, but I know you like Julius Brents. Tyreek Stevenson was talking for a while. I know you asked him a couple questions, um, but these are just, and, and lastly, I just want to say Garrett Williams was a guy that I took in my mock draft that, you know, just coming off an ACL and I, I can't quit those guys that are like, he's a prototypical guy. He does everything they need. He's coming off an ACL. Talk to him. He said, hey, I think I should be cleared by camp. So that's a positive development for him. He just reminds me, though, of a guy like you've already got one up the top. Maybe you grab him in the third or fourth round. And now you've got two good-sized corners that are really going to reinforce the room. It's just funny because all these names that you mentioned, besides maybe the exception of Witherspoon, are all over six feet tall. Yep. Like, all these guys are big. I really like Julius Brenz from Kansas State. Thought he had a great senior bowl week. I think he's got that uh, length at six foot three, physicality on the outside. He needs to work on his, you know, ability to play the football in the air and down the field a little bit. But I think that he's somebody that can project really well. I mentioned Clark Phillips, and I'll, I'll just uh, quickly on Jordan Addison. I did ask him about. He went toe to toe with Jordan Addison twice at Utah, and uh, really kind of one of those marquee matchups. And that was something that I was really trying to do a lot of as much as I could with these corners and these receivers is let's see best on best. Like when you go up against, you know, Juju Brents against Quinton Johnston, uh, Clark Phillips against Jordan Addison. Like these are the matchups you want to see. And I thought Clark Phillips really battled with Jordan Addison. Addison got some W's. He got some W's and it really went back and forth. And the one thing that he mentioned about Addison was how patient he is with his route running he's really good at pacing his routes and he really makes the defensive back almost antsy of when where are you going because he's really really patient and then all of a sudden he hits the gas and goes so I thought he was a uh, Phillips came away really impressed with Addison's route running. He also mentioned his elusiveness as well. So we'll talk to Addison tomorrow, and he'll be a star of the weekend, I'm sure, for Patriots fans. So it was interesting to pick people's brains about guys they went up against. You know, I was talking to Cam Smith about uh, Another one. about yeah. Jalen Hyatt, right, and going up against Jalen Hyatt. Uh, Cam Smith, South Carolina kid, uh, Stephon Gilmore, J.C. Horn. Like, that's kind of be, becoming CBU yeah. to a degree down there. And he was mentioning going up against Hyatt and how they got back into the uh, meeting rooms on Sunday in South Carolina, and he said, give me Hyatt. I want him. Give him to me. Now, when I watched the film – and I asked him about this, uh, he played eight yards off of Hyatt the entire game. <laughs> yeah. Never challenged him. Yeah. And I was a little disappointed in that because I wanted to see him have that alpha and just kind of not just give up eight-yard hitches the entire game and really try to challenge him. But he mentioned that they run a lot of option-style routes where they give Hyatt the choice of going deep or sitting it mm. down and that yeah. type of thing. So he was just trying to get him to sit it down every single time, and that's ended up what happened. Especially with Hyatt, who reminds me like a Taekwondo Thor and just the body type. And you just love to see, you know, how can he press him? Can he get, can right. he get, can Hyatt get off the line? It was more about Hyatt too. Yeah. It was about both of them. I wanted to see Hyatt challenged at the line of scrimmage and it just didn't happen. All right. Well, great stuff. Really a lot of great players today and, and plenty for us to, you know, continue to dig into with this cornerback class, trying to, you know, find favorites, find fits. Uh, we're going to give you guys right now. We talked to Mike Rodak from AL.com, uh, gave us a bunch of insight into Bill O'Brien. Uh, you can check that out here. All right, we're excited to be joined now by a name that Patriots fans are probably pretty familiar with, Mike Rodak, who you started with Mike Reese. You went up to Buffalo for a while. Now you've been with Alabama, so uh, you're with AL.com now, and we're excited to welcome Mike in. 
we got some big questions here, obviously, about Bill O'Brien, and uh, yeah, we yeah. know the Alabama connection. So thanks for joining us, Mike. How's your combine been going so far? It's been good. It's been good. It's just, you know, it's part of basketball season when you cover college sports. So you kind of got to stop for a few minutes and go back to football and remember, oh, yeah, there's 13 Alabama guys here and remember what to ask them and, you know, all these games that happened back in the fall because as soon as you shift to basketball, sometimes your brain kind of turns off football for a while. And when you see Bill Belichick out at Alabama's Pro Day mm -hmm. pretty much every year and he's out there with Saban, yep. I always see the pictures. But what have you just sort of witnessed of Bill at Pro Day at Alabama specifically? Yeah, so they had no Pro Day two years ago because of COVID. This past year he was there and, you know, he's walks in. I think it was Matt Patricia last year. They were talking to Bill O'Brien, who happened to be there last year. And, no, they, they kind of watch. They kind of stand back and talk to each other and – it's one of those things for a while, I'm sure people were saying we'd love to just hear what they have to say. And then I think NFL Films said that documentary a few years ago where they mic'd them up during that. And, you know, they're talking about players and where did you take this guy? What does this guy do well and all that? And obviously we can't really walk up and listen to that. I'd love to. But, um, yeah, you know, it, it, you always hear Nick Saban talking about his time with Belichick because he does like a weekly radio show. And he's always telling these old stories about being in Cleveland and some of the things that he learned from Bill. Um, and it's just two guys who at this point in their career are just trying to keep on winning and see how long they can do it. Same thing at Alabama. People don't know how long Nick Saban's going to coach, and we'll have to see how many more he wins. So the obvious question is you saw Mac Jones play, win a national championship. You've watched Bill O'Brien for a couple mm -hmm. of years. I'm, I'm sure you're probably with the Patriots when Bill O'Brien was the offensive coordinator there. Yep. Um, just what is kind of your expectation of how those two guys are going to come together and, and what do you kind of expect to see from the offense with Bill and, and Mac? Yeah, obviously the, the story everybody knows about Mac teaching Bill O'Brien to play book when he got to Alabama. But, um, yeah, it, it's, you know, and Bill O'Brien was obviously – quite frankly, not well liked by Alabama fans. And there's, we can talk about it more, but it's the standard is so high down there that um, if you're not winning every game by 40 or 50 points, you're not winning every game and winning a national championship every year, people are gonna look for somebody to blame. And because of Nick Saban's success and the seven rings that he has on his finger, nobody's really gonna blame Nick Saban. Um, so it's always gonna flow down to coordinators. And it was really both sides of the ball last year. So. That's kind of why Bill O'Brien, I think, caught some of the flack. It's just the, the dynamics of fans not wanting to blame Saban. Um, but really, the offense was great at Alabama. And how much of that gets carried over to New England? You know, they really run Alabama's playbook there. They run what Saban wants. Um, it's from all the offensive coordinators they had, they've, they've kind of passed that terminology down. So he's going back to what he had in the NFL with New England, with the Texans, I'm sure. Um, and that was successful with Tom and with what the pieces they had around him back then. And, you know, personality wise, I think him and Max should get along. I think Max, an easy guy to get along with from what I've known at Alabama. A lot of players liked him there. Um, and, you know, he's, he's fiery a little bit. And we've seen that emotion from Mac. We've seen the emotion from Bill O'Brien over the years. And, it's, you know, it's not a bad thing. I think both of those guys are passionate and I think they'll they'll work well together. You mentioned the infamous story of Mac teaching Bill O'Brien the playbook. Mm -hmm. What do you actually know about that story? Because I don't think it's ever been explained to me further than just the fact that they might have had a day or two together and they might have taught the playbook to each other. It's a good question. <laughs> I, I have never dug deeper into that myself. Um, but, I mean, Bill O'Brien got down there. That was like right after the Ohio State National Championship game. So that was in January, probably the second or third week of January. And then Mac wasn't drafted until the end of April. So that's three months where Mac was probably working out. And um, I know he was still around to a pretty good extent during those three months. So I think it was more than just like a, a single day, two day thing. I think it was, they were both around the facility a, a, a decent amount. And um, again, it's Saban has always said like, you're running my system. And it, that's, I think that's tough for some guys to come in and kind of give up that, that power and what they've run for, for a long time. And um, you know, I, I don't know exactly if they're doing it on a whiteboard or how exactly it all worked, but- <laughs> Wrong, it, it try again, like, Bill O'Brien. <laughs> right, <laughs> if he was quizzing him or, or any of that. But um, yeah, it, it, I think that's, that's certainly built a relationship between those two. And I think it was more than just a, a single day thing. Even if they're you know running Nick's playbook 
was there anything that you saw from Bill O'Brien that just said, hey, that reminded me of what I saw from the Patriots? Just elements, anything that, that you kind of connected yeah. over the years? Yeah, I mean, definitely the screen game. I think they used more um, than what they had done under Steve Sarkeesian before that, where I think Sark was giving me a little bit more of RPO stuff, slants over the middle. And you had Alabama people just screaming for Bill O'Brien to run more slants over the middle. <laughs> but that's also because back then they had – Jerry Judy and Jalen Waddle and Devontae Smith and Henry Ruggs to run no slants, take the ball and run 70 yards. And they didn't have those guys with Bill O'Brien. Um, no, that feeling. So, yeah, you kind of had to take it more in smaller chunks with the receivers they had. Um, they've had a couple bigger, I want to say slower, but not blazingly fast receivers like Jalen Waddle was. And you kind of have to use the personnel the best way you can. I think Bill O'Brien did that. Um, and, again, I think the screen game was certainly part of that. Um, you know, some of the swing passes to the running backs did remind me of New England going yeah. back to like Shane Vereen sure. and, and some of those guys. But they had a great running back to do that, too. Yeah. Um, and Jameer Gibbs. So he used the personnel that he had. And I, I don't think he can just snap his fingers and, um, you know, make an 80 yard touchdown out of thin air. And I think fans, again, were just mad that stuff wasn't happening as quite as often. Yeah. yeah it just before we move on to some prospects, I'm definitely mm -hmm. going to pepper you about <laughs> a, a slew of those. But just in general, I, I'm always fascinated by Nick Saban's conversation that he had about we need to evolve on offense right. I think this was like 2015 2016 yep. somewhere around there and uh, how did you see Bill O'Brien jump onto that bandwagon of mm -hmm. we gotta light up the scoreboard now in college football to compete and not be this ground and pound type of team yeah anymore? yeah it's interesting because it's there, there's some thought that it could go a little bit backwards for Alabama this year but um yeah they really moved to the spread and having you know, a quicker pace under Lane Kiffin, like 2015, 2016, and then Brian Dayball did that, and then Steve Sarkeesian, and then Bill O'Brien. And that's, you know, they were moving quickly at some points and had three or four guys spread out, and that's kind of what college football had become, and that's what Nick Saban wanted to run. But there was actually, their running game wasn't great. And there was a few situations last year where they needed a couple yards, needed to chew the clock a little bit, and they just couldn't run the ball. And that was, I think, a source of frustration for Saban. And Saban's already talking about wanting to get back to more balance on offense next year. Um, so I think O'Brien certainly embraced it. But I think sometimes the forces move in both directions. And if they were able to run the ball for three plays in a row at Tennessee, they'd probably win that game instead of lose it. Because otherwise, they couldn't run the clock down and ball went back right. to Tennessee, and they won that game. So. Yeah. All right, we'll make the jump into some prospects now because, I mean, as always, of them, the right? Alabama right. guys are, are always the top of the list for, for Patriots fans. And um, I just want to start it with Brian Branch, who clearly mm -hmm. not a huge need for the Patriots. We know every year they seem to take, uh, you know, those kind of hybrid strong safety types. But the two safeties, I mean, both of them are really good. Mm -hmm. How do you see those guys? Uh, you know, I, I mean, I, I think that it's probably out of the Patriots range right now, but it seems like Brian Branch is a plug and play player for yeah, them if they yeah. needed him. I feel like mid first round is still where he seems to be projected. So if you want to spend a first round pick on him, I think they, they probably could. He probably would would be there yeah. at 14. Um, you know, it's a guy who I think came in with comparisons to Minka Fitzpatrick. I don't know if he ever met those, and that's not a knock against him. Minka Fitzpatrick was a fantastic, like, all-American level player at Alabama who was making plays all over the field. You know, Brian Ranch wasn't quite to that level. I think it's a little bit unfair to, like, judge him by that, but that was kind of the comparison from a playing style standpoint that people thought of him as. Um, and he played a lot as a freshman. Actually didn't play much as a, as a sophomore, as much. Um, just because of there's another guy who kind of played his spot and it was a competition. They went mm -hmm. back and forth. And he really didn't find his true footing, I would say, until this past season as a junior. Where, you know, played a lot of in-the-box safety type stuff. But can cover slot receivers. Um, did a really good job against Brock Bowers, I would say. Against, you know, against Georgia. Um, was probably the best tight end in the nation next year. And um, you know, he can cover tight ends. He can probably cover the slot. He didn't play much deep safety. So that's a projection to see if he could do that at the NFL level. He probably could. Um, whereas Jordan Battle played a lot of deep safety yeah. um, and you know, made some plays there as well. So two different players. Um, I think they would both work in the defense and in two different ways. And um, you know, there's, there might be some overlap between Branch and Duggar, but I think they 
could still be both on the field at the same time. Yeah. I found it fascinating that one, he's working out with the corners this mm -hmm. week instead of safeties, and two, he's 190 pounds maybe, yeah. and you project him into the box at 190 yeah. pounds in the NFL. It's a little bit of a concern. And I, I yeah. when I was watching him on film, like, well, he's got the speed, he's got the instincts. Maybe this is a Devin McCourty like transition where mm -hmm. he plays more on the back end in the NFL. He's a really good tackler, so I think that makes up for his size and that he just fundamentally, technique wise, a really good tackler who didn't really miss many tackles. Um, he's also, you know, a good pass rusher too. They used him uh, to get after uh, get after it on blitzes and had a few sacks and um, also had a few picks too. So he was able to do a few different things. But yeah, you know, he it, more position wise, he did play corner. Like within the Nick Saban system, he was more of a corner because he played in the slot with the star position and then played in the money position, which is almost like a linebacker type role. Um, never really played outside corner, but also didn't play deep safety either. And there was some talk, like, because he, every, they had three juniors declare for the draft right after the Sugar Bowl, and two of them were obvious, and Bryce Young and Will Anderson. Brian Branch waited, like, the, until later that day to make his decision, and there was some talk that morning that maybe he comes back to school for a fourth year, plays deep safety, and shows teams he could do that. Right. Because that was the big question about him. Any other guys in the Alabama group that, that particularly stand out to you, maybe ping the Patriots radar a little bit? Yeah, you know, there's – you never quite know. Like, I was surprised when I took Christian Barmore because, like, Barmore didn't yeah. do a whole lot at Alabama and it's turned into a really good player in the NFL. Yeah. Like, he was – that was a projection on their part, not a guy who I would have thought of. But – so you're not 100% sure about, you know, who do they like exactly. Cameron Latu at tight end I think would be interesting if um, – One of my guys. Yeah, we'll have to see, obviously, what happens with, you know, John o. Smith long term. Can they put Cameron Latu in, in one of those roles and have two tight ends that, that can move? Like, Latu's got some athleticism to him. Yeah. Um, and Shoney can catch the ball, too. So, you know, mid to late round guy, it seems like, with him. Um, you know, Jameer Gibbs is not going to be on the board, I don't think, <laughs> um, when they pick in the second round because he'll be late first, yeah. early second. But they could use that pass catching back that is kind of that outlet for Mac. Like, Brady used that for 20 years. And, like, you don't have the receivers open, you throw to your running back, you get five or six yards, and that's effective. Like, that's yeah. a good thing to have. You know, Stevenson can do that, but he's also your, your bell cow running back, and to have him down, you know, all three downs on the field is, is tough. So they could use a guy like that um, if he drops or if they move up or something like that. But um, there's not a receiver in this draft for Alabama, which no, is surprising. Patriots fans are yeah. upset about that. And they I mean, can certainly use a receiver. Right. No, but you're talking my language with Gibbs because mm -hmm. I'm not a running backs guy. Yeah. I'm a running backs don't matter. No, yeah. no running backs in the first round. Mm -hmm. I, that, that's me. But I was watching Alabama against Kansas State. Yeah. I was really watching Tyler Steen, mm -hmm. and then Gibbs just, I mean, every every time he touches the ball, it's like he shot out of the cannon. Yeah. And I'm like, this guy is in a different he level is. of speed. And like you said, they can – throwing balls out of the backfield. Mm -hmm. They can move him in the slot like Bill O'Brien did a little yep. bit and play him at receiver. Yep. And in a way, I would label him for the Patriots fans because I, I, I know, I can hear it already, Mike, <laughs> if the Patriots draft Gibbs, they're going to – Patriots fans will lose their mind. A yeah. running back right. early in the draft, what are we doing? Right offensive weapon he's a he's a weapon, weapon right in, on offense it's and like I, ty montgomery yeah better quite right frankly. yeah, yeah. And, and you you don't don't get too caught up in the rb right mm -hmm. of it and i think with ramondre ramondre can be the between the tackles you know mm -hmm. workhorse running back and gibbs is more of your playmaker yep. and, and i could see that working yeah, and that that's a big part of the i think the bill o'brien offense historically is what kind of having that guy it yeah. was Vereen when he was there and Kevin Falk before that and was, you know, Charlie Weiss. So, yeah, that could help. I mean, Tyler Steen, just to go back to him for a second, yeah. like I think he's probably going to play guard at the NFL level. Yeah. That's what he – I think he practiced at the Senior Bowl there. And he was a solid tackle for Alabama. I don't know if I would spend an early round pick on him to play tackle in the NFL. Um, but you can take a flyer on him mid-rounds and maybe he's a guy who can play both tackle and guard and kind of be a backup for you and see what you can mold him into. Yeah. Yeah. Any, anybody else, Evan, you want to, before we let Mike go? Uh, he mentioned a, a bunch of the names. The only other name I would mention is Eli Ricks. I don't know yeah. What, his, yeah. your opinion on him. He came out blinged out at the podium earlier. That it was, was not a uh, – it was a little bit of a disaster for him, quite frankly, <laughs> yeah. Um, for – yeah, at Alabama this year. Huge expectations coming in, who was a freshman All-American at LSU, top 10 prospect at LSU, and had a great freshman year there, and then was hurt his second year, transferred to Alabama, People were already talking about him as a top 10 pick back in May. Right. And, all, you know, preseason All-American. He was going to start for him. He didn't even earn a starting job out of camp. 
he didn't play the first six or seven games out of the year um, and finally earned that job in the middle of October and then a couple games later got a concussion and was out again for a little while so uh, just a bit of a disaster in terms of learning the playbook and um, I, I don't think there was off-field issues necessarily with him but just there was certainly issues in learning Saban's playbook that Saban's talked about that Ricks has talked about and it came along really slowly for him but he's long and that's his biggest trait is he's long and he's tall for me personally having covered the Patriots 2010 to 2012 the name that comes to mind is Razai Dowling oh no uh, when Uh-oh. I think of Eli Ricks so <laughs> Again, there's you can project him that he's long and that can you can use that against tight ends or whatever. But um, we'll have to see what he runs in the forty because I don't know how fast he is. I'm gonna put you on the spot oh. before we let yeah. you go. If there's one Alabama player, just in general, mm-hmm. who do you see the Patriots taking? And one guy that you would say is this guy is a Patriot. Uh, Branch. Yeah. Yeah. Just personality-wise, position, versatility. I can see Branch being a fit for them. He's Mike Rodak. Mike, thanks for joining us. You're the authority, Alabama to Patriots. Nobody better, so we appreciate you taking the time with us You got it. Thank you. All right, that's going to do it for Evan and I here at day three of the Combine, day two of prospects. And, I mean, it's only going to get better here on Friday and Saturday. we got quarterbacks, wide receivers, tight ends, running backs, and offensive tackles, offensive line. Uh, It's going to be really cool. A lot of big needs for the Patriots. I know. It it doesn't quit. And, you know, we won't quit for you guys. Uh, we got you covered every 